Actually, he says it's clear that intelligence agencies interpret their legal mandate expansively. Michael Hyden, the former director of the NSA, famously said, quote, give me the box you will allow me to operate in. I'm going to play to the very edges of that box. I will play very aggressively in it. Canada's foreign intelligence agency, CSE, is similar by exploiting the uncertainty in the legal definition of metadata it can, quote, incidentally collect troves of personal data on Canadians. Canadian domestic intelligence agency CSIS also operates under a similar culture. And he gives another example and then goes on to say, under Bill C-51, CSIS's expansive capabilities were broadened even further. The only limits to their new and vague disruption powers are that CSIS cannot willfully obstruct justice, cause bodily harm, or violate sexual integrity. I promise this is the only very detailed question like this. So there seems to be a culture in intelligence agencies of working the law to their purposes and pushing the law to its boundaries. Intelligence agencies don't ask what their surveillance practices should be. Rather, they ask what their surveillance practices are allowed to be. And then he says, this can create the appearance of lawfulness, which the government points to whenever the activities of intelligence agencies are challenged by the public, but all it does is subvert the law. So here's the question. How do we ensure that intelligence agencies interpret the law not just narrowly, but in a way that is reconcilable with what the public reasonably expects? When reforming our intelligence agencies, do we have to abandon the premise that intelligence agencies are committed to following the law in a reasonable way? Uh, so this is a great question. It's a very complex question. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, you, uh, the, the question quoted Michael Hayden, uh, former director of both the NSA and the CIA, uh, which is a little bit of a mistake uh, because, of course, if you're the head of the CIA and the NSA, you are literally a professional liar. Uh, deception is sort of your business. So he has a little bit of a checkered history because he says, uh, you know, give me the, the lines of the box and I'll, I'll play to the edge. Uh, I'll get chalk on my cleats, but I won't leave the field of play. Uh, unfortunately, we have documentary proof that that's not the case. Uh, he was actually asked uh, as director of the NSA in the post 9-11 period uh, by the president of the United States through the vice president's lawyer. Uh, would he basically violate the law? Uh, there was a controversy where the attorney general of the United States said that the NSA's operations were unlawful. Uh, they could not be performed consistently with the authorities that were provided uh, under the Constitution uh, or statutes that had been passed authorizing their operations. Uh, and the president came to him through these proxies and said, would you go ahead and continue spying on everyone anyway, even if the attorney general is against it? And he said, yes. Uh, and this is not, you know, this is not to beat up him specifically because he's not so important. He's just one of a long line of officials that do the same thing, as you mentioned. It happens across borders, it happens across uh, cultures, it happens across languages. Uh, you're kidding yourself if you think intelligence officials in France, Germany, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, you know, Brazil, India, aren't doing the same thing. Uh, this is how they operate. So this means the central premise of that question, how do we trust and ensure that we can trust these intelligence agencies uh, and officials to interpret the law fairly, to operate fairly? And the answer is you can. But what you can do is put processes and structures in place where you don't have to. And this leads us to kind of the failings of C-51 uh, and the larger problem uh, of Canada's intelligence apparatus where there is no oversight that's meaningful. Uh, there are three main problems, uh, fundamental problems with C-51, uh, which the current Prime Minister of Canada, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, did campaign uh, to reform and unfortunately has not done so. Uh, most experts who have studied this bill say it actually can't be reformed in a meaningful way. As written, it should be repealed entirely. Uh, and then a better uh, measure passed from scratch uh, that loses all the baggage. But first off, there's no meaningful oversight there, right? What would be meaningful oversight? How do you ensure 
uh, that you don't have to trust these intelligence officers. And the way you do that uh, is you appoint a judicial body, uh, some mechanism, some structure, some commission that has independent prosecutorial authority. It is mandated to perform a case-by-case review of these intelligence agencies, these police agencies, their use of powers, exceptional powers, after the fact of investigation to ensure that no illegalities occurred. And if they did occur, they can then prosecute on this basis. The only thing that will ensure that these intelligence agencies uh, or police agencies or even corporations as they gain access to these kind of mass surveillance capabilities uh, play fairly is the threat of criminal sanction. Now, this means basically you don't get in the way of the intelligence services uh, saying, look, you've got to go you know, do all of these things before you investigate uh, this person or that person, before you pull the email of someone that you suspect is a terrorist. But you must know that in every case, we're going to have a judge and a prosecutor going through your decisions uh, after the fact. And if you did break the law, uh, you will be held to the account of our laws in that case. Uh, the second thing is sharing without necessi- necessity, transparency, or accountability right. Uh, Canada's services can now make available all of the different uh, information that they hold about you. And this can be things such as your health records, right? It doesn't have to actually be anything spooky. Uh, they can now be traded amongst agencies, even if you're not related to some real uh, terroristic threat or anything like that. Uh, it's not very well limited. And then there's this larger question of the criminalization of speech, right? Uh, We already see that spying authorizations, uh, legal authorizations, sorry, that weren't intended to be used for uh, spying in this context or for surveilling people who are not terrorists uh, or real criminal threats, violent threats, threats to life, uh, and so on and so forth. are instead being used, repurposed for monitoring terrorists and things like, or <laughs> monitoring terrorists, forgive me, uh, monitoring journalists who are not the same as terrorists, uh, despite what the GCHQ says. Unless you work at an intelligence agency, in case you might be worried about them. But uh, the idea here is, let's take that example uh, of the Canadian journalists who have been spied on by the Montreal police. We have the news story saying that what happened, but we still don't actually know under what legal authority it occurred. There is a uh, suspicion that this was actually done under uh, Bill C-13, correct me if I'm wrong, fact check me audience, uh, that was actually intended to be passed as a cyber bullying law. That's how it was branded. Was that actually being used to collect communication of journalists? Was C-51 involved? Were any of these other legal authorities involved? We don't know because we have no idea what the government is actually doing underneath uh, that curtain. And that is not just a risk. Uh, That is a fundamental danger to the stability of any open and liberal society. Suddenly, we have a set of rules for all of you in the audience. There's a set of rules that can get whistleblowers uh, and journalists charged and investigated by police. But what about when police break the law? What about when spies break the law? Suddenly, they're being held to a very different legal standard, uh, and they're entitled to a a veil of secrecy uh, that inoculates them against criticism and scrutiny that the rest of us do not enjoy. That is an imbalance of power uh, that is not only, I would say, um, unwise, but is actually anti-democratic. It is authoritarian in nature.